It's very smart. Thank you. 
This lighting is too. Right, we're unmuting ourselves. It's two minutes. I've asked for the lights to be toned up. I think it's good. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. We've turned down the opinions on her her also my new sense of You just can't No, I've just unmuted myself. So now I'm. Testing. Testing. Can you hear me? Yes. But um, and Andrew, I don't know why when I unmute myself, then someone keeps muting me back. Again. It keeps auto muting me. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. So and uh, welcome to the first webinar hosted by Philippine Tunneling Society, um, titled First Impressions of the 2019 FIDIC Emerald Book. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over the presentation to James Ricard, President of uh, Philippine Tunneling Society. James. Thank you very much, uh, Abby, and welcome everybody to our first virtual uh, meeting event. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we still have uh, the COVID-19 uh, with us and that we're unable to uh, meet face to face. Anyway, um, even with the COVID-19, uh, we've been uh, busy uh, working and currently we have, um, we have built a website and it was recently uh, published. So please go to uh, www.philtunnel.com and bookmark it. Uh, we'll use this website to um, uh, promote uh, news and events and also to uh, provide the uh, information from the meetings and upload the PowerPoints from the presentations. Uh, also, we have a LinkedIn account, which is the Philippine Tunneling Society. OK, so unfortunately, we've uh, missed a few months, uh, but we are starting uh, back again. So today, 25th of September, we are having a, uh, a talk uh, presented by uh, Pinsent Masons on the Fiddick Emerald Book. Uh, next month, on the 23rd of October, we have another meeting, which will also be a Microsoft Teams live event, and this will be by uh, Macaferry. And they will talk to us about steel fiber reinforced concrete for segments and based on international subway projects. 
Then we would like to hold another event on the 27th of November. Uh, to date, it is a uh, free slot. So if anybody would like to present, particularly our main sponsors, uh, please contact Abby and then we can uh, fill in the slots for you. After that, we'll have a Christmas break. So there'll be no meetings in uh, December. Normally we're gonna have a get together um, at the Elks Club or another venue, but unfortunately that's not gonna happen now or we can't see it happening now. Um, and then obviously January, everybody will be coming back uh, from Christmas break. So we won't have the meeting then. And then hopefully in February, on February the 7th, we would like to try to resume our regular meetings at the Elks Club. But if uh, the situation with COVID uh, has not changed, then of course we'll hold it uh, through uh, Microsoft Teams. And then after that, um, we'll hold the AGM and another presentation on the 6th of March. So basically uh, we'll try to resume the uh, first Friday of every month and the, the presentations will be between February and November each year. So like I said, um, if you would like to uh, present at um, the Philippine Tunneling Society, then send us an email and uh, we'll uh, look into it and uh, try and fill a slot for you. So again, uh, thank you very much for the uh, corporate sponsors and the corporate members, uh, without which we are unable to um, uh, organize these events. And I'd like to announce that um, due to us missing uh, a number of ev events uh, this year, the, we have decided that um, we will extend everyone's membership until uh, the 31st of December 2021. So for all those that have already paid their uh, subscriptions, uh, don't worry, um, you'll, you'll be getting uh, another year uh, for the same subscription. So also, if uh, anybody else would like to join, uh, please contact Abby um, at the uh, Philippine Tunneling Society uh, email address. So um, talking about membership, uh, we still we have uh, certain categories, uh, corporate members, corporate sponsors and individual members. And they are the bank account details. Uh, we have a registration with uh, BIR now. Um, so we are able to issue uh, ORs for companies that require them. OK, um, unfortunately, there's not too much uh, tunneling news um, due to the uh, COVID-19. Uh, but we, we are aware that uh, MWS has, has uh, released tender documents for Altip 5, which is uh, a parallel tunnel to Altip 4. It's around six and a half kilometres long and uh, it, tra it transverses from uh, Ippo Dam to Big Tay uh, with so uh, associated uh, uh, intake and outlet works. Also uh, in the news, um, it was recently announced that uh, Makati Subway construction was awarded to China Construction's second engineering bureau for an value of 1.2 billion US dollars. Basically, this is an eight kilometer subway line which uh, encircles the district of Makati. And the final bit of news, um, it seems that uh, Kaliwar Dam Tunnel is um, starting to move forward. Uh, this is a Chinese funded project and it involves a 27 kilometer tunnel, which is uh, four meters in diameter. So we obviously expect that as it's Chinese funded, a Chinese contractor will uh, win the works and we'll try and keep you updated when there is further developments. OK, so coming on to tonight's presentation. So as you already know, uh, the format for the presentation is a Microsoft Teams live event. We have um, a question and answers uh, session after the event, um, but we we cannot um the sorry the the people watching the event they cannot uh, speak through the microphone so if you would like to um ask any questions please type them um into the uh, chat box and if anybody uh, likes the the questions then please uh, click the uh, like button uh, to give it a thumbs up so basically uh, the more thumbs up the more chance the uh, question will be answered after the uh, presentation um, obviously, if there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, questions being asked, then we can only select um, a number of them as we don't have time to answer them all. 
so therefore we will use the most popular um, liked comments and that which will be discussed after the uh, presentation. Also, please be noted that the uh, presentation will be uploaded to the website uh, after the event so people can uh, review uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint again at their uh, own pace. So tonight we have uh, two speakers. So the first uh, speaker is Bernard and he is a partner in uh, Pinsent Masons in the Pinsent Masons Construction and Advisory Disputes Group. He is a construction lawyer specializing in large infrastructure projects. He has 28 years post qualification experience in the field of construction law, having previously worked in Singapore and Australia before relocating in Hong Kong in 1998. He has previous experience with the FIDIC suite of contracts and is a regular speaker at FIDIC conferences. He has been recognized as a leading construction lawyer in Who's Who Legal since 2015 and is ranked preeminent by Doyle's 2020 list for leading Hong Kong front end construction and infrastructure lawyers. And secondly, let me introduce uh, Zita. Um, she is a specialist uh, transactional lawyer in Pinsent Masons Construction and Advisory Disputes Group based in Hong Kong. She is regularly involved in drafting and negotiating EPC, design and build and uh, operate um, contracts and related to uh, contracts in Hong Kong and internationally in energy, transport and the infrastructure sectors. Zeta also regularly advises clients on project and contract structuring and administration and subcontract management based on the FIDIC standard form of contract and NEC3 and NEC4 target cost contracts. So tonight's presentation is, uh, is titled First Impressions of the 2019 FIDIC Emerald Book, Conditions of Contract for Underground Works. So this is an hour long seminar. The speakers we've invited are two specialist construction lawyers from Pinsent Mason to give us a brief introduction of the new Emerald Book published by FIDIC in a joint endeavor with the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association. The contracts, the conditions of contract for underground works designed by the contractor is unique in the FIDIC suite of contracts. Not only is it the first contract designed to be used for tunneling, and indeed for any works that include a significant geotechnical uncertainty. But because of the allocation of underground risks are intended to be shared by the reference of a geotechnical baseline report. These conditions reflect the fundamental principle which underlines all FIDIC contracts, namely balance risk allocation between the parties of the contract. So the speakers will share their insights as to why such a balanced risk allocation will contribute significantly to a positive project outcome in contracts for underground works. So without further ado, I will now um, like to uh, introduce uh, Bernard and Zita to uh, present their topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, let me thank the Tunneling Society for giving us this opportunity to share our insights on the Emerald Book. I think the Emerald Book is here. It's getting a lot of interest. In fact, we're doing another talk on the same book uh, probably next week to a, to a group of developers in the Philippines as well. Now, I think it's a bit daunting for two of us lawyers because we are lawyers, but we're talking about tunneling to a group of tunneling experts, but we, we shall try our best tonight. Um, I think I think our job, we see it as, as you know, in the construction sphere is to convince employers, in fact, that actually uh, this form of contract is a very unique book that is going to be of interest to them, not just in giving a contractor a blank check for more money or more claims. This form of contract actually leads to a much fairer allocation of risk. And also, in our view, because of the amount of disputes we do in Hong Kong and in the region on underground conditions, 
it actually promotes the dispute avoidance. Now, of course, you will say, hang on, these are lawyers, these are sharks uh, who, who thrive on construction disputes. But let me assure you first that Zita and I, uh, we are actually among the sharks, what we call vegetarian sharks, the veggie sharks, right? We, we, we don't like disputes. We do contract drafting and tendering. And, and we, if we do our job well, there shouldn't be any dispute. So we like Admiral Book because it tends to lead to a fairer contract and avoid all this costly litigation that, that we see. Right. So as many of you would know, FedEx has um, 10 forms now, which we call the Rainbow Suite. Um, the primary books are the red, yellow, and silver for build, design build, and EPC. Pink is for M uh, MDB, gold for design build and operation. Green is the simplified form and white for consultant contracts. And the first spe specialist form is the blue book for dredging and reclamation. Now, FIDEC has uh, now came up with the second specialist book, the Emerald Book for Tunneling. So, um, the Emerald Book actually largely based on FIDEC um, second edition yellow book, Lump Sum mm. Contract, and it's actually have six pages of am amendment, amendments now. So um, these are captured in the notes uh, section of the Emerald Book, which everyone could see what are the difference between um, the yellow book and the Emerald Book. So briefly on the use, um, it's mainly for tunneling and underground con uh, construction works. Why do we really need a special book for tunneling works because it has some unique features and mainly it has a lot of extensive excavation works and the method of which and the ground support form parts of the works. So works it itself is defined very widely. And secondly, it incurs a lot a high financial investment by the contractor for equipment, which Bernard will talk about more on cost of construction uh, in case there's any change of subsurface condition later on. Bird. Now, before we go on to the Emerald Book, let me let me just talk quickly about the FIDIC 2. I mean, FIDIC 2 came out, and the and reason why we have to have a quick look at FIDIC 2 first is, as Zita says, the Emerald Book is actually based on the FIDIC yellow, FIDIC 2 yellow. Um, if you look at the hundreds of pages, it's a very heavy book. It's about 1.5 kilograms, way too heavy. Um, Six pages are basically the, the Emerald Book, and the other hundred and whatever pages are still the fitted yellow. And, and I think what, what you will see is that when we talk to developers about using the Emerald Book, um, one of the issues that they have is they're not really familiar with FIDIC 2. I mean, everyone's using FIDIC 1 since 1999, so everyone's very familiar with FIDIC 1. And, and I think for, for employers and their quantity surveyors and their advisors, uh, the, the, the first hurdle is to actually understand what's in FIDIC 2, and then on top of that, understand what's the ammo book that adds to the FIDIC 2. So again, it's very important that people get used to FIDIC 2, and, and therefore I think it's timely. Spare me two, three minutes when I rush too quickly uh, FIDIC 2. Now, the, some of the features in FIDIC 2, of course, are the engineers. The engineer used to be God. Now it's even bigger than God uh, because he has got more proactive roles, more responsibilities, and also probably more liabilities because he's now have, he takes on a much more prominent role um, for example, contractors claims FIDIC, 28 days time bar, right? Now the engineer himself has a time bar. Now, if he doesn't uh, dispute the contractor's claim, he might be time bar, leading to possible liabilities to his clients. So be careful, the engineers out there. So FIDIC 2 has got that sort of um, very proactive role for the engineer now. Uh, there's also a greater procedure on your clause 3.5, which is now 3.7. The determination, right? This is the clause that determines contractors' claims and all that. Uh, it's a lot of scrutiny on the engineer now, a lot, lot more, I can assure you, right? So his instructions are under greater scrutiny. Um, advanced warning. Everyone loves advanced warning from the NEC, so employers love it. It puts a lot of burden on the contractors. But hang on, FIDIC 2 now says you are now sucked into that process as well. So engineers, employers are now obliged to give advanced warning to the contractors and not just the other way around. So again, um, FIDIC tries to be fair and reciproc reciprocal, and, and some employers have sort of said, hmm, we like the old system better where it was just one way from the contractors. Um, variations, I mean, variations are now one of the grounds of contractors because that we, we engineers keep asking for variation proposals, and then they say, no, nah, we don't want it. 
Now you have to pay for it as well, which is something quite new to, to some, some employers. Um, delays, I think delays, there, there is now a very horrible word, and some of you will tell me this because I've negotiated with you before in the same room. Uh, gross negligence is introduced. Now to, to contractors, it's quite a bad thing just because you know deliberate default and reckless misconduct is a very, very, very low standard. Gross negligence is something that might worry you a little bit more uh, because of FedEx 2, so be careful of gross negligence. Now there's a host of other uh, arrangements in FedEx 2 that will be good and bad, like fitness for purpose, oh my god, there, there's an indemnity now for contractors. So you have to indemnify for breach of the fitness of purpose and also fitness of purpose used to be applied to a hydroelectric plant, to a power station. Now FedEx applies to even major items of work, so you have a big fitness for purpose and a series of small fitness for purpose obligations. But on good data side, it's good news. Um, plant, plant, FedEx 2 now introduces a two year limitation because you know, plant ENM cannot be the same as civil works. And therefore FedEx has recognized that for, for plant and ENM, uh, there should be a two year time bar and not your six years or 15 year time bar that you get in many countries. Um, employers claims are now reciprocal. Again, this is not very popular when I speak to employers about the ML book and FedEx 2 because they said, look, we don't want to be subject to the same 28 day time bar that contractors have. And, and that's where I think you'll find a lot of pushback on FedEx 2 in general, and, and, and that affects the ML book as well. Right. So let's dive into the Emerald book. So I think everyone would agree that it's very, very difficult to predict underground conditions, underground behavior. So any approach to just allocate risk to one party like the silver book would, would not be feasible. So it is now more important for the contractor and employer to both share risk of the underground conditions by carefully allocating risk under the contracts. So this is so the question is, how do we really allocate the risk? And this is the main focus of this presentation. And we have to ask ourselves these questions first. How do we define unforeseeable? Second, can we be paid on measurement basis? Third, can we get EOT or adjustment to time of completion? And lastly, can we also claim for time related costs outside of measured items? So I think Bernard, can you let us know how the Emerald Book really define unforeseeable? Right, so, so we got four big topics. The first one, how do we allocate risk? Now, the, the, the way we allocate risk is in FedEx is the centerpiece of the Emerald Book, and that's the uh, GBR. And I'm sure all you tunnel experts, you're, you're much more familiar than me with GBR. GBR is not a new concept, it's been there forever, uh, as long as I know. But, but what is new in the FedEx is the way that GBR is treated, the way it is applied, the way it is made a contract document, and having the highest priority. I mean, goodness. So the GBR, far from being a, a document that you see being bunged into the uh, technical specifications or even site data and it's for information or for reference. We've seen that very common in Hong Kong and elsewhere where employers have a GBR, but they just sort of put it as an afterthought without saying how the GBR interacts with the legal stuff, right? And that's where disputes arise. Now, FedEx seeks to avoid all that. They will say, look, this is now a contract document. And not only that, even overrides the lawyers. I mean, my goodness. It is above the priority of the GCC and the employee's requirements. So again, it takes highest priority above all those documents. It is the single contractual, okay, single contractual source of risk allocation. More importantly, what does the GBR do? People like to put lots of data in. Avoid that. What, what is happening with the, the, the animal book is that this should set up the employer's preferred risk acceptance, his risk level, his tolerance. And the important point employer often doesn't get and he should get is this. It may deviate from your factual geological data. So one is legal, one is technical. The GBR, believe it or not, has to be legal. It is about your risk allocation and not about your actual factual data. That goes into what we call the GDR, which is the geological data report. Now, of course, then because this GBR defines from a legal perspective, uh, what is foreseeable and what is to be borne by the contractors and what is to be put into your contract price and your contingencies, uh, I think employers need to adequately invest in extensive investigation before tender. They need to be aware of the ranges of possible scenarios. 
decide on his risk levels or his lender's risk levels, and then prepare the GBR accordingly and set the right level. It's very crucial. If you set the wrong level, you throw everything to the contractors, it, it actually results in very high bid price and it, it defeats the whole idea of having the MO books. Now, the employer then, uh, who, who will not be as familiar with GBR as you guys, uh, he has to prepare the GBR, right? He has to prepare it with his consultants and FIDIC has then come up with a sample content page. It, it is a content page, as you can see part of it on the screen. Um, it doesn't show the, the contents or what the contents say, you just have the, the title. So you see introduction and general project information. There's a part A and part B. Now part A is the background information. I don't like this. And I'll tell you why. I don't like this because there is a significant risk in there for contractors. Part A encourages a lot of wobbling and, and, and people just throw everything into part A to say, this is the background, this is what we've done, these are the ball locks, and wrong. You don't put that. You know why? Because FedEx says what is in the GBR is foreseeable. What is foreseeable, the contractor bears. So if you do that and you start putting lots of data in here, it affects your foreseeability. The more goes in, the more smart a contractor you're supposed to be and the more risk you take. So again, any conditions that are described, the word use is described in a GBR, the Emerald Book says it's deemed to be foreseeable. The word deemed means I don't care whether you can foresee or not, you are deemed to have no knowledge. So it's very dangerous to have a part A if it's going on and on about raw data and about general site conditions. And part B, part B, this is the real part. This is the real part that we want to look at. This is the operative part. This is the one that allocates risk. It's very brief. And I think to be fair, when I speak to employers, they, they, they don't really envisage how this actually works. And this therefore gives us a concern, as I said, for contractors, part A, if you contain raw data, it leads to foreseeability when it's not supposed to, you should put it in the part B. Now the reverse for part B for employers, and this is a risk that is commonly sort of expressed to me. They say, hang on, Bernard, what if it's not addressed in the GBR, something, a risk, a ground risk, and we forgot to address it or because we never saw it coming and it's not in, in part B. FedEx then says whatever conditions that are not addressed in part B could be deemed to be unforeseeable, uh, deemed, to be for, deemed to be unforeseeable. Now, the employers are worried, of course, is that, hang on, I better make sure that my GBR is very, very exhausting. It better cover everything under the sun because if I don't put something in, I don't want the contractor to say, see, you didn't put it in. Whatever's in is deemed foreseeable. Therefore, whatever is not in is deemed unforeseeable. And here's my claim, please pay. And, and employers are really, very really worried about that. And that's the biggest concern I think they have. Now the guidance for GBR is next and it contains a wealth of technical information I don't really understand and you probably understand better. But I think what's important, if you look at the subsurface conditions, they give you guidance on how to prepare it. Do not be too hung up on parameters that are geologically oriented. Now, what do I mean by that? Instead of saying and talk about soil properties and this, this per permeability parameters for the soil, avoid all that. You know why? It doesn't help you. What you want to go for is the end result, seepage estimations, how much grounding requirements will be should be stated. These are using quantitative terms, BQ terms that can be measured and verified, and most importantly, paid. Right. So Felix says, don't concentrate on the permeability parameters. Concentrate on seepage estimations, your grounding requirements, your your whatever your your lining. Your, your lining, your excavation, whatever, things that are BQ. Because you know why? What, what, what is not clear to many people when they read the uh, Emerald books, they say, look, GBR. Once it's a GBR and it's worse than a GBR, we can claim cost. But that's for other claims, not for, for, for GBR. Thing. You have to link back to a BQ item and it work like grouting. Then and only then can you claim it. Now the next slide is a very busy slide and it's probably the most difficult slide, it's the most confusing slide and I apologize and I assure you this is going to be, it, it gets better after this. So FIDIC is looking at a GBR, it's a new thing, it's a new tool that they then graph onto their FIDIC 2 yellow book. And of course the basic allocation in yellow book, for those who are familiar with the first edition, it's also in the second edition, it is called the 
foreseeability or unforeseeability. It's a wrong word. I hate foreseeability because GBL doesn't talk about foreseeability. GBL talks about what's acceptable. So it should be acceptable conditions, unacceptable conditions, not foreseeable. Because people can foresee many things, but they may not accept it. So Phoenix says unforeseeable employers risk, foreseeable contractors risk. Then you go to the definition of what is unforeseeable. And Phoenix says unforeseeable is not reasonably foreseeable by an experienced contractor on the base date. Base date is tender submission date minus 28 days. So 28 days before you submit tender, that's the base date. So Phoenix says not reasonably foreseeable by an experienced contractor. So it's an objective standard, all right? So that's the yellow book, first and second edition. Now what they do, they graph on the GBR to this, and they say notwithstanding the aforesaid, the uh, whatever subsurface physical conditions that are described in the GBR will now be deemed unforeseeable. Now the word deemed in law is very important. Deemed means we don't care about actual knowledge. We don't care about what is foreseeable, not. We don't care anything. We just care that it's deemed. Deemed means deemed and it's final. So what is described in the GBR is deemed foreseeable even though an experienced contractor would not have foreseen it, for example. Now then they then go on to say what is a condition that's outside the scope of conditions defined in the GBR is deemed unforeseeable. So they, they change from the word described to define in the scope. And I think that's where I, 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 I struggle and I lose sleep at night. No, I'm just kidding. I'm lying. Mm -hmm. um, the, what does the scope mean? I think the employer then says, do I take the risk of an incomplete GBR? Because the scope means to me, whatever is scope is there, whatever is outside the scope is deemed to be unforeseeable. And therefore, I pay the contractors. And I think that's where it's unfortunate. And I tell employers, don't worry. I don't think this is what it means. But if we do a contract, we have to define carefully. Because what, say, for example, artifacts, a bomb, you know, um, terracotta warriors, whatever. It's not something that we normally put in a GBR. Now, if the employers didn't put it in a GBR, it's outside the scope of the GBR. What happens is that he probably forgot about it, right? He never thought about having a terracotta warriors while you're digging. Um, if he wanted to say that it's a risk that he takes, he would have to say GBR artifacts equals zero. So if you find one artifact, then he will pay for it. But that's not what he says. He just did not think about artifacts. He did not put it in the GBR. What he wants to be saying is that if a contractor then encounters artifacts, you have to prove that you could not have foreseen it under 412. You cannot say it is automatically deemed and he has to shut up and pay. I think employers don't want that kind of uh, a liability where, where they have to define a very exhaustive GBR. Now then to, to further compound this, this, this uncertainty, 412 itself, which deals with the basic allocation, says, look, we deal with all physical conditions in general, but for those that are described in GBR, go to a new gloss called 13.8. And we'll talk about 13.8 ad nauseum in this talk, right? So just go to 13.8. Then we go to 13.8, it then deals with GBR, fine. But then they say if it's outside the limits, and I'm like, my goodness, first you say the scope, and now you go to the limits. If it's outside the limits of GBR, you go back to 412. I mean, surely guys, that's wrong. That's, that's not good for contractors. Why? If I say, there's going to be water seepage up to 50 cm per hour or whatever, okay, seepage, it's 50. Surely, what Felix should be saying is that if it's outside the limit of 50 cm per hour, then you deem it to be unforeseeable. Because I have only priced for payment, for, for dealing with water seepage that goes up to 50 cm per hour. Anything beyond that, I want the employer to pay for it because I did not price for it. Right. I don't care whether, uh, why do I have to go back to 412? And then go back to 412, I have to prove what an experienced contractor would have foreseen. I don't want that. I want to be paid as a contractor. So I think there lies, there's a lot of unhappiness with the clause. And I think in practice, when I any clients, any developers come to me, I, I will revamp this completely because I think it adds a lot of uncertainty for employers and for contractors. And this is not helped by Fedic Forward that says, all physical conditions not addressed, in other words, used in the GBL should be unforeseeable. Employers get very nervous with this. So um, some clarity, I think, will be good. Uh, some clarity because I think FedEx, if you find any GBR, okay, whether it's Emerald Book or something, I think we have to demarcate three scenarios very carefully. One, when do we deem something unforeseeable? Deem. Two, when do we deem something foreseeable? 
And three, when do we go back to a general test and we inquire, not deem, we inquire if a reasonable contractor would have foreseen? I think that's very important. Second thing about the GVR is the, the clarity that I would like is to have the distinction made, which they do not make between a range of conditions, like groundwater permeability we just mentioned, or the presence or absence of something, right? Like the bomb or unexploded ordinance or pollution or whatever. It, it is different the way it is phrased. So if it's a seepage that we foresee, say uh, section one, we think 50 to 100 cm per hour, but we set the limit at 75 cm per hour. This is a contractual thing. It's not a real thing. Less than 75, foreseeable contract depends. More than 75, what happens? Think carefully. If it's more than 75, you would say this is outside the limit in the GVR, not outside the scope, because the scope deals with water seepage. Outside limit, and then G the FIDIC says go to photo and prove unforeseeable. That's wrong. If it's outside the limit, you have to just deem it as unforeseeable and say that's that's a contractual allocation. That's agreed. That's what, what the price for. So again, the, the use of the word scope as opposed to limit is wrong. It should be outside limit, you deem it unforeseeable. Now, vice versa, if it's a presence of something, a present condition like uh, a, an exploded ordinance, a bomb. Again, this is outside the scope of the conditions in GVR, or outside the limits. Again, it causes confusion because of the, the, the use of scope and limit. So be careful. Of course, for the employer, he will say, this is outside the scope, and I still want it to be proven to be unforeseeable, not to be deemed. So again, you have to be careful. And I know it's very confusing, but if you sit down carefully, it will all come through to you work out at three in the morning when you sleep. Don't worry, that's what happens to me. <laughs> so clarify scope and limits. And, and for contractors, of course, you have to be careful that you don't want too much general description in GBR. And, and for, for those preparing GBR, GBR should be very, very brief. Anything else should go into the, the raw data that should go into the uh, GDR, not GBR, right? And of course, the question for employers that they ask and, and that you should ascertain in a tender is, is the GBR to be considered exhaustive? Does it cover all geologic, geologically related uh, allocations or is it just a, 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 a narrow uh, uh, allocation of risk for certain uh, GI that is set up. So again, it is exhaustive or not. It's a very important question. And of course, you then acquire whether items that are not stated, but you would expect to be stated. Do you deem it or do you still have to go back to your 412 to ask whether a contractor would have foreseen? On the other hand, for those that are not stated, but you would probably not expect to find a GBR, can the employers then assume it will not be automatically deem unforeseeable? That's a very important question as well. Now, be before we go on, um, these are the two regimes of allocating ground conditions. I've summarized for you the old and the new. Again, feel free to look at it. Uh, on the left side, you'll find the test of unforeseeability in the old yellow book. Uh, and the right side is a new emerald book where you go into the GBR. And of course, if you look at the left and the right, uh, the left column then uh, allow, uh, requires you to prove unforeseeable using objective standards. It's a bit more difficult. But what you do get is cost with the word capital C cost. And you know FedEx defines cost as on-site, off-site, head office expenses and all that. It's a very open um, definition of cost. It's very broad. Cost includes everything except profits, all right? Whereas on a new regime, what you do is you have to prove that the ground is worse than GBL. It's a lot easier. You don't have to show what a reasonable contractor would have done. You just say, hang on, you said 75, it's 85, pay up. And it's very simple proof. But it's also more demanding. Because your entitlement is not cost, your entitlement is measurement that will come to next. You have to measure a BQ item. You can't make up cost uh, by, by putting a few items together. And the last thing is notices. FedEx says if under the old regime, you have to give multiple notices under 4.12, the, the, the clause on, on ground conditions, as well as 20.2, the, the, the often hated clause by contractors where if you don't give notice on time being 28 days, uh, your time bar. Uh, new regime, no notice needed. I hope I'm not going too fast for everybody. But, um, okay, anyway, <laughs> if it's too fast, I apologize. We, we have a lot to cover. Um, 410, now before you go on, uh, you notice what we say about the GBR and the way GBR interacts with other tools is quite important. So you having put the GBR in, what about things like site data? 410 in FedEx, as you know, is the site data. It says that uh, any um, site, site data, then uh, there's a double deeming. You, you deem two things. You deem that the contractors obtain all information that will affect uh, the risk of the works and its tender. 
It also deems that you've inspected a site, that you're super happy with the site, that you're satisfied before something tender. So now all these two are now subject to the GBR. I think I think it's a very simple way of making sure that there's no clash between site data and, and, and deeming provisions and GBR. Now 4, 4102 also deals with a very important clause. It deals with the, the fact that you are deemed a base of tender on the GBR. So again, your tender must be based on the GBR and the limits in the GBR. And it also says this, look at the proviso, irrespective of any discrepancy or ambiguity. It's very important. There will be ambiguity or there will be discrepancy because the GBR is done by some engineer and then the site data is done by some other engineer or by the lawyers and there'll be discrepancy. And what this proviso says is very important. It prevents the employer from arguing that, hey, you know, Mr. Contractor, whatever the GBR says, you should have known from other data that are given to you the ground conditions are actually different from the GBR. And so it says, no, 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 you can't, you can't make the argument. The GBR always prevails over other raw site data, and that's the protection given uh, to contractors. Now, the third, of course, is the geotechnical data report itself. This is the GDR. This is where you contain your raw factual data. This is your factual information, your ball logs, your whatever information. It doesn't contain any legal interpretation, doesn't contain any allocation of risk. So remember, raw data, GDR, um, legal uh, allocation of risk, GBR. And of course, the GDR, you can say, then what's the purpose of that? The purpose is this, if, if there uh, is an alternative construction method uh, uh, that is agreed between parties because the original method can't be used and the GBR is silent, the GDR is important because they say reference should be made to the GDR to amend the GBR. So the GDR is like an overriding reference point. If the GBR is silent and you change your construction method, you have to use that GDR to amend the GBR. So Bernard, you have explained extensively <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> how the Emerald both define the rather confusing, um, unforeseeable concept in, in relation to GBR in the Emerald book. So the next question is, how do we or do we get remeasurement in uh, when there is increase in anticipated um, quantities for ENL works? OK, let, let's start with 13.8. So we referred to the 4.12, uh, that's 13.8 now. And 13.8, when I first read it, is very misleading because it says, you know, look, um, unless already stated, E and L works shall be subject to measurement. And people get very happy because they, oh, whoa, whoa, this is a very significant shift from the lump sum based yellow book. Remember, yellow book is design built lump sum. You don't get any measurement. Any quantities in the contract are estimated and doesn't form part of the contract. Now, what it says here is that the envisages that the E and L, the excavation lining works. So there has a section on E and L works may be remeasured. It doesn't say all ENL works shall be measured. So be careful. There's no reference to GBR here. And again, it's not, it's very tempting to conclude that there's a split between ENL measurement and all other works lump sum. That's the wrong approach. That's not true. Now you read carefully again, 13.8 uh, paragraph we just seen. So it just says that all lining works are subject, are potentially subject to measurement. Second paragraph, it says contract price shall be adjusted following such a measurement. Again, it's just a, a statement that says if, if there's a measurement, if there's a measurement, then you will adjust the contract price. The third paragraph is very important. It just says this. If the subsurface physical conditions actually encountered, so as encountered, are outside the limits, you go back to 412 and you, you have to then prove unforeseeable. So again, this this is it's, it's very unfortunate and I know some of you have struggled and I struggled to be honest when I saw this. What it does say is this, if you uh, fall within the limits of the GBR, so if you say 75 cm per hour and it's more, then only and only then do you measure the quantities for excavation lining works that are set up in another new document called uh, the schedule of baselines, otherwise known as the SOB. Uh, yeah, SOB, sorry, maybe, I'll, okay, SB then, sorry, SOB is the wrong term. Um, schedule of baselines, S SB. Now, if the GBR is not triggered, and then you go to 412 and you claim cost. You can't claim to say, I want to measure from this, you can't do that. You have to prove uh, under 412 is unforeseeable, but only if it's outside the limits of GBR, whatever that means. I mean, remember we said earlier, outside limits either means it's more than the 75, or it is uh, outside totally because it's something like bombs or, or artifacts. It's very important that, that this be distinguished in any contract, I think. Let me show you the 
the SOB, sorry, the SB. Now, as uh, an example schedule of baseline that FIDIC has provided, uh, it's a lot more detailed, I think, than the um, contents page for the GBR. Now, the, the, here you can see there is a linkage between uh, the GBR and SOB. Now, section one, you see highlighted in red, there's, there's excavation tunnel cross section, excavation section one, and it refers to the GBR drawing XX. And of course, what is put here is the 500 meters. And you see, you see the second circle. Quantity, example, uh, 500 meters of excavation. This is what I call the um, reference quantity. I won't say it's an estimate of foreseeable, that's the wrong word. This is a reference quantity put in by the employer to say, look, if the drawing is right and the GBR stays as it is, we, we think it's 500. Now, if the item uh, is wrong, then these quantities will have to be measured. And that's where the third column comes in, the measured quantity. You then apply this to the BQ rate and you will get your adjusted uh, cost as well. And this is what happened. You must have a quantity set out in the SOB, the SB, in the SB that then measures, that allows you to measure the increased quantities due to a change in the GBR. It's, it, to me, it's very complicated. So it's GBR, SOB, quantities, then multiplied by the rates in the BQ. You don't get cost. It's not a blank check for cost. So if an item doesn't appear in the SOB, you get nothing. Before I go on then, uh, there are two sub clauses that are relevant to this process. 13.8.1 uh, deals with the measurement process and just contract those the measure, submit, the engineer determines the measurement. That's quite standard. Now, what is important is 13.8.4a. 13.8.4 is the key entitlement clause. It says that the contract price will be adjusted by the engineer by valuing each item, the E&L, by applying the measurement agreed under 13.8.1 above, multiplied by the rate in the BQ. So again, I think it's very important. We, we can't concentrate in the, in the GBR and SOB on ge geological features like, like permeability. You know why? Because there's no item for that in the BQ, right? You, you don't have a BQ item for permeability, but you do have an item in the BQ for grouting, for example. Therefore, any GBR must have a grouting uh, BQ item that allows you to measure the grouting and apply the grouting rate in the BQ, right? So no cost, only BQ, only measurement. Great. So after assessment of um, quantities, what about time? Like, do we get EOT or adjustment to time for completion? So in Emerald Book, um, it operates in two parallel regimes. First is the traditional FIDIC 8.5 EOT, which deals with all the regular EOT, except that any adjustment to the time for completion arising out of the measurement of ENL work, which shall be determined pursuant to 13.8. So 13.8.3 here is a parallel e, uh, EOT, or as the contract calls it, adjustment to time for completion, AOT regime. So what is the key difference? The key difference here is whether the change of subsurface condition causing EOT a condition within or outside the limits described in a GBR. So as illustrated in this diagram, whenever there is a change of sub, uh, subsurface physical condition, the contractor is here to determine whether it is within or outside the limits of the GBR, and that would affect which clause or which regime it is going to follow to claim their AOT or EOT. So if there's if the change is within the limits of the GBR, we'll look at the blue path on the right. We will follow 13.8.3 measurement to get AOT. So as Bernard said earlier, there is no formal notice required because this is an ongoing measurement mechanism. However, if the contractor determines that, oh, it's actually an out, that the change is outside the limit of the GBR, then we have to look at the red path on the left. Then we will follow 412, that we have to prove unforeseeable, and then we claim EOT under 8.5. Here, two notices will be required, one, is under 412 to notify the en engineer of the mm. physical condition and why it, it is unforeseeable. And then secondly, if it um, 
uh, there is delay or incur cost, then you claim under 20.2. So, okay. So, but let's focus on the new regime 13.8 remeasurement for ENL works within the limit of GBR here, since it's new in the MR book. So 13.8.3 provides that the time allowed shall be reassessed by the engineer by applying the production rate to the measured quantity in the schedule of baseline. Under the um, definition of the Emerald Book, schedule of baseline is a document setting out the ENL activity and the corresponding quantity based on what is described in the GBR and the corresponding production rates. So there are three things. And in the guidance, it tells us that all the subsurface conditions described in the GBR shall be addressed in the SB. So, but what does... <laughs> SOB. Stop confusing me. Okay. Okay. So we're actually not entirely clear what does um, address mean, but we think that as Bernard um, mentioned just now, anything under the GBR, there must be a corresponding item in the SOB. Okay, okay, SOB. <laughs> Fine. So for quantities, production rate, these are the things that you have to put it in the SOB. If so, if there is a change of the GBR, then there's a change of the measured quantity in the SOB. Then applying to the production rate, we can reassess the time. So for example, the GBR described there's a C page. Right, and the contractor has to make sure that this is translated to a grouting quantity in the SOB and, and insert a production rate for grouting. So if there's a change in uh, the seepage rate, then the grouting quantity will change. And applying the production rate, then we probably have a longer time for assessment of time. So back to 13.8. The first, uh, the first paragraph says that, oh, time is assessed by production rate to the measured quantity. So SOB said, okay, 500 meters long of excavation, the contractor puts the production rate 10 meters per day. So the estimated time would be around like 500 meters divided by 10 meters per day is 50 days. It Even seems- Lawyers can calculate. Yes. Okay. So Sorry. it sounds very simple and Ooh. mathematical. <laughs> but then we actually have to be very careful that, that this 50 days is not the um, assessment of or the adjustment of time for completion. We, based on this reassessment, only if to the extent that the time for completion is or will be of impact, then they will calculate what is the extension of time or adjustment of time. So the contractor has to show that there is actually an impact to the critical path. If there's no impact to critical path, then no impact to the time of completion. There will be no adjustment to the time for completion. So here is actually an example. So the employer estimate that there will be five excavation of niches. And then the contractor thinks that, OK, I can do 0 0.5 niches a day. So the estimated um, working day would be five niches divided by 0 0.5 niches per day, then we get 10 working days in total to do to excavate five niches. However, after measurement, the contractor measures and the engineer agrees that there are actually six niches. Then applying the 0 0.5 um, niches per day production rate, then we will get actually 12 working days. So there should be two extra day more now. However, as we mentioned in the paragraph two, whether there it leads to a, an adjustment to the time for completion will depend on the program and whether it there's an impact to the critical path. So if there is no impact to the critical path, the program can um, accommodate two extra day without adding in um, um, adjustment to the time for completion, then there will, no, there will be no adjustment to time for completion. So we mentioned a lot about production rates just now. 
Mm. It is important that we highlight um, production rate in the SOB are filled in by the tenderers, and this estimation uh, has to be consistent with the GBR. And however, we have to note that um, clause 8.2.2 and the guidance made it very clear that production rate itself do not automatically lead to AOT just because the production rate are not achieved. So say, for example, the contractor said that they can excavate at the rate of 10 meters per day, but in reality, they could only excavate eight, eight meters a day. But I'm sorry, because you put down 10 meters, then it's 10 you will not get any adjustment uh, to the time for completion unless there is a change of the measured quantity. So since adjustment to time for uh, completion equals to the measured quantity divided by uh, production rate, mathematically, if the contractor puts a slower production rate, then it will probably get a larger or longer time uh, assessment. But of course, um, this has to be consistent with the GVR and also the program. But lastly, on production rate, I would like to remind contractors that um, AOT does not only apply when there is a delay or extension, but actually for reduction as well. So meaning that if the measured quantity is lower than an estimation in the SOB, the engineer may ask you to accelerate and reassess the time and shorten the time for completion even shorter than the original date. Yeah, that's very unusual. That That's the first time I think I've seen FIDIC do that. Um, anyway, so probably they want okay, to be bear, bear with us. Last, last five minutes, bear with us. The, the, the fourth item is the what we call the time related cost. And this is still cost, but again, to recap, right? What we dealt, what I dealt with earlier on was the cost of the uh, excavation lining works, the primary works itself. Now, what about work that is not um, quantity related? And, and of course, the BQ uh, for your for your project uh, must clearly distinguish between uh, four items, fixed rate, uh, fixed rate item where it's subject, you know, it's not subject to any adjustment for quantity, so it's a fixed charge. You have time related items where it's a price for work which is proportionate to the length of time taken to execute the work, but it's not dependent on quantity. And that has to express in units for calendar day, so X dollars, a calendar day that's your time related charge for for rental of a tbm or whatever right so that's not the excavation lining works that is actually your your equipment cost for example in the time related item there's quantity and its value but of course of the four the important one is the time related uh, items so so just to summarize right we, we talk about gbr gbr or centerpiece gbr allows the employer to set the um, allocation of race you want but the GBR then has to translate to an item in the SOB, the quantity in the SOB, that's what I call the reference quantities, 500 meters or whatever. That quantities, if the GBR change, that quantity is then remeasured. And when you remeasure that, you multiply by the ENL works rates in the BQ to get extra cost. Now then the remeasurement also leads, secondly, to an adjustment of time that Zeta talk about. So again, uh, SO, uh, uh, GBR changes, SOB, quantities change, you get paid for the re-measured quantities, you get AOT assessed based on the re-measured quantities, and in turn, the EOT then, or AOT, the adjustment of time, leads to a claim for time-related items based on how many days of uh, AOT you get, EOT, right? AOT is because it's adjustment of time, EOT is an extension of time, and that's not right anymore, as Victor says, it could be a reduction of time, an ROT, in fact. So there, there are all this hidden dangers of fitting. Um, and, and you remember, we look at 13.8.4, that's the key entitlement clause. Uh, it simply says that, look, for, for this uh, time-related items, you simply apply the rates for those items that you, you indicate are time-related, and you multiply by, by the adjusted time for completion uh, under the, uh, the, the 13.8.3 that Zita mentioned. So it's a, it's a mathematical thing. You just apply your, your item X dollars per day by five days of EOT and there you have, that's that's your cost for your time related items. So just to recap, um, I think I think of the four questions, uh, difficult ground conditions, uh, just the conditions that are described in GBR, deemed foreseeable contractors risk. And again, please beware of conditions that are, uh, are, are described in very generic terms, right? We, we, we want to have specific terms like 75 CM per hour C page. We want to have 500 meters of lining. We, we don't want to talk about 
about geological properties of soil or, or, or you know, and all that is, is too, it, it doesn't make a difference, it doesn't, doesn't help. Uh, beware of conditions that are not described for employers. Employers are very careful about things that are not described. They want to know whether is it deemed to be unforeseeable and that they will get a, a bill from the contractors or do we still go for the uh, inquiry whether it's, it, it's deemed, it, to whether it's unforeseeable or not. The cost of ENL works, certain elements are to be measured. Again, these are tied to your SOBs. You must have a quantity SOB. Do not, do not fall into the error of thinking, look, as long as GBR changes, I can measure the quantities or I can claim cost. You can't do that, right? You can only measure items that are in the ENL works that are set out in the SOB. Time for completion, again, adjustments from the quantities that changes leads to uh, 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 AOT. And time later items that just cover that. Again, the EOT then in turn leads to a claim for uh, the, the time later items based on the BQ rate multiplied by your EOT. Are we done? No. I believe it's time for my beer. Sorry, my beer o'clock. So um, just to conclude, I think, I, 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 what do I think of the, the, the Emerald book? I think it's great. It, it's a great form. Um, it, it is it is it's introduction of a, if a specialist form that is, sorry, <laughs> and th there are some concerns that I've, I, when I speak to lenders, especially, I think employers firstly are, are, are afraid of the complexity of FedEx 2. I mean, what we just told you is only a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more uncertainty, but we want to deal with all those in one hour. It's, we can discuss after this if you want to, but it, com employers are worried about the complexity of FedEx 2. And as you've seen, the uh, very, very onerous obligations of FedEx 2, and that causes them to be a bit about the adoption of ML book, right? And of course, consultants are, are worried about the liabilities because of the way that GBR is prepared, uh, whether they translate the client's uh, uh, risk allocation correctly, whether the clients are properly briefed about the, the impact of the GBR and ML book. Um, budget overruns, let's be honest. Um, budget overruns, I don't mean the cost of the project. I mean the budget overrun from the initial price that the employer thinks is going to pay. Right, so because of the uh, measurement of ENL quantities, because of the time with the cost, the budget could will run, and uh, the the completion date also you'll probably get a keener date, but, but that date might shift a bit more than you expect, and that's not good for project finance. As you know, I mean lenders uh, on project finance they don't care about the cost because they, they're lending the money and getting money back anyway. What they care about is certainty of completion date, certainty of budget, because that's the loan that they get. Therefore, I think it is quite true that I think you will find projects uh, adopting ML book are those based on what we call balance sheet, uh, on the balance sheet of the developers rather than a project finance, because project finance people always want the FedEx silver. They, they, they just know the one, they are, they are very, they're, they're very colorblind. They only know silver book. Any other inner books, Emerald to them is not great news for the, for the banking industry. Um, in Hong Kong, what do we do? I mean, I'm, I'm sure people from Chunbo and the rest know, I mean, we do a lot of, uh, for, for underground. Uh, there's also alternatives in target cost, uh, pain gain share, NEC. I mean, that's one. Some of the concepts from NEC could in fact be put into the ML book if that helps with it. it's, its acceptance by employers. And lastly, no caps. I think employers need some caps because if they're doing a the project finance and there's a budget overrun, whatever the budget overrun is, if there's a cap, it's easier because he can give a contingent equity uh, subscription agreement. In other words, we, we borrow X dollars from the bank, but for any budget overruns, we promise the bank that we will contribute equity in order to cover that cost because banks want to see that assurance of uh, there'll be sufficient finance to pull, to finish the project. We don't want a half-finished project. So the, the challenge for employers, I think, is that the ultimate test when I speak to employers is that are, are they enlightened enough? Can they, you know, assuming they can afford this, this budget and, and completion uncertainty, are they prepared to take on a more balanced risk approach to avoid disputes? And because they must be concerned, no, employers must be concerned about this. You always pay for ground condition. You can't escape that. It's not as if you're not paying and suddenly you're paying, right? Introducing a baseline doesn't change that fact. But what, what, what a properly set GBL does is this. It, it ensures a level playing field where you actually assess contractors and you choose the best contractors. And because people who are more experienced, a better contractor who can foresee more things will end up with a, 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 a higher price just because the contract is not certain about it. If you set the limit at 75, then there's a level playing field and, and everyone tenders and you can choose the best uh, contractor from the developer's point of view. This is what I sell to them. And of course, employers end up paying for risk that may never materialize. What I mean, I mean, if you, if you, if you just go on a silver book or even the yellow book, 
what what they're paying for is a risk that you think you uncover as contractors. But if those risks doesn't materialize, then it's money paid to the contractors that they don't. Now, compare it with paying a higher bid price. Why don't the employers set a limit and then only pay if really bad conditions apply? I mean, again, it's not paying more money. It's just a different way of paying it. You're gambling against, hey, maybe things are not as bad as we think. So why pay for the bad news when the bad news may never come? Again, it's something that employers need to consider. So, um, last slide. Sorry, I know I'm running out of time. Um, I, I think what 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 can the society do? I just I sit myself and say, look, you know, if I were the society or contractors, how do I get employers to um, adopt the annual book? And 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 I think you know, I think employers above all, I hate to use the word, they need to be educated. And I think it's true that they need the confidence that this is not a blank check for contractors. They need to have a, a set of SCCs or special conditions that they can use with their existing in-house form because they have a form that they are familiar with, or maybe to use it. FIDIC 1. I mean, it's not difficult because what you have in MO book basically are add-on conditions to FIDIC 2. There's no reason why if you get a good lawyer, hint, um, uh, they can actually uh, draft the same SCCs and tag it onto FIDIC 1 as a standalone. Again, I think the, 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 the preparation, uh, you know, but by someone familiar with, of a template GBR and an SOB will go a very long way. I mean, FIDIC 1, FIDIC doesn't have a GBR even, so employers don't really understand what the GBR does. They need to understand what levels are set and that anything that's not covered in GBR is not necessarily their risk. You know, they need to be convinced, right? You might want to limit the excavation lining quantities to the main ones. Don't, 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 don't go for the whole entire gamut of the ENL quantities because employers get very nervous with that. Um, maybe setting a realistic cap. Again, maybe limiting your time-related items to really, really key equipment like TBMs and not your small pumps and valves, for example. Um, NEC, pain gain share and caps is getting quite popular in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Again, I mean, that, that is always seen as an alternative to Emerald Book, but I'm, I'm just querying whether some sharing uh, of, of costs and risk could be possible and not simply say above 75, it's 100% the employer's risk. Maybe some sharing might convince employers to say, I, I think there's incentive for the contractors not to come to that, that situation as well. And of course, I think it all ties in with, with education of employers and lenders so that they have confidence that this is truly a case of not a blank check and not more claims uh, from contractors and not more work for the lawyers in the dispute arena. Not us, but the uh, con construction claim lawyers. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Bernard Zeta. Thank you very much for that. It's um, an excellent presentation. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm bringing my gear up. Having a beer. I just want to well. make sure um, we're we're all connected together. So we have a number of questions. Um, so I think I think we'll go to a few of the questions and see if we can try and answer some. Uh, can you Can you see the questions on the, your sidebar? No, or no. not if not um there's uh there's an icon with okay. a question mark and some speech bubbles on the on the bottom on the bar no. i don't know if you can see that or not okay it's next okay. to participants yeah yeah okay um can you read it now yeah yep okay so the first, the first question's got the uh, highest uh, number of likes by Scott. By, it was a question posed by Malcolm Lorimer, and he's asking um, how the Emerald Book can be applied when projects involve both underground and above ground works. Will there be a separate conditions for the different sections of such projects? Thank you. Um, I, I have to go back to the Emerald Book again. Uh, what, what they have proposed in the Emerald Book is that there, there will be uh, physical conditions in 412 and that the GBR uh, will contain then the, the allocation for subsurface uh, physical conditions, if I'm not mistaken, so will check that, right? So, so I, think, I think what FIDIC is, is envisaging is that the GBR uh, and 13.8 only applies to, to uh, subsurface physical conditions. And of course, you know, in the beginning, remember FIDIC says, so uh, excavation lining, uh, excavation works are very um, unique because of this site access, for example, or the land belongs to other people. 
Now, we have not considered that because if, if you encounter those uh, above surface conditions, the all you have is Felix 412, and you go back to the old yellow book on, um, on, on, on whether an experienced contractor would have uh, foreseen. So, so, so if, if, if I understand the, the allocation correctly in, in the MO book, uh, above ground conditions, for example, including your site access and, and others, uh, you, 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 you don't use it a GBR. But again, there's nothing to prevent employers from putting a GBL, uh, 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 an item on site access, if that's the case. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no harm. I don't know whether I've answered that question, but it, it is true that, that, that there are three, there are two regimes. One, the GBL 30.8, which, which is meant to deal with subsurface and, and 412, which deals with everything else. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think I'm going to scroll down to a uh, question at uh, 6.33 with four likes. How do you think the construction industry will accept the new Emerald Book? Who would prefer the Emerald Book? Contractors or owners? <laughs> Contractors. <laughs> yes, okay. I, I, I <laughs> that, was a sim I, that was a simple answer. <laughs> sorry. I think okay. the owners are coming slowly around. They like the idea of, of the book, but to be honest, I mean, they, they, they still have their suspicions. And like I said, I, I I think the forward to the to the Emerald book doesn't do any favors because that's all the employers ever read, and and they read yeah. and they say, oh, anything that's not a GBR is considered to be uh, unforeseeable, and they will face a claim, and that to them translates into a blank check for contractors. They don't like that. But I say, guys, yes. guys, that's not what it says. But it's a bit unfortunate, and the way the drafting is said is unfortunate. I think employers have to be convinced that look, the GBR is a standalone document. A GBR should be exhaustive. You shouldn't have anything. So if the employer doesn't talk about a risk because he chooses not to or he forgets, that's a big thing, right? He forgets a, a, an item because his consultants forgot or the employers forget. That should never, never lead automatically to a claim for 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 um, for, for for cost because that is open okay. book. Cost is open book, and I think employers will then have the confidence uh, to do that. I, I talked to employers a lot. I said, look, you know. A GBR is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not that you're paying more money. It's, 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 to, it's making sure that you pay uh, for the right thing. You're paying for what really happens, right? Whereas if you go for a FedEx yellow or even silver, you're just paying a huge contingency. And it's a gamble because on the one hand, uh, if the conditions are much better than you believe that, that everyone thinks, then you are paying for something that never arises. It's money for nothing for the contractors. Well, I, I won't say that, but it's it, you're paying more profits. On the other hand, if if the conditions are really, really bad, and that's where my colleagues for litigation lawyers will all be laughing at because that's where the disputes arise because contractors can't afford to pay for it and they will have to sue. Money comes from, from somewhere. Someone has to pay for the ground conditions. And I'm afraid it's not the contractors who pay for it. It has to be the employers. So again, Arrow Book, I think, it's good for employers, but it will take some time for them to uh, get around to seeing that. And, and I hope people like us will, 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 I won't say the word educate, but will enlighten them to say it's, it's not a bad thing, guys. It's, it's a good thing. It's, it's a more useful, it's a more accurate payment scheme than a, a, a lump sum, uh, very, very crude, very, very, um, you know, basic kind of contract. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I think that's pro probably answered a couple of more uh, questions further down. Um, we have another one at uh, 6.52. Um, is it possible if the quantity reduces or the ground conditions are more favourable, can the time for completion be reduced? Yes, uh, I think um, in in 13.8, it especially says that it could be reduced or extended. So after reassessment, okay. Um, if the if the condition is more favorable or less uh, onerous than what the GBR is saying, then um, the the assessment could reduce the time for completion. Yeah. So the engineer can actually reduce the time. For it's completion. not a very good cross, isn't it? I mean, it, it, okay. what it says is this: like, if you have quantities in the uh, in the in the SOB. And if there's more quantities, of course, then you, you really get an extension of time. But what it, what it does say is that there's less quantities. The engineer can assess and say, I think there should be an acceleration because it's less. And, and you may say, well, hang on, FIDIC has the same thing. No, not true. FIDIC 1 and 2 has got the old 412. And what it does say is this, 
if there's unforeseen ground conditions in section A, I'll give an EOT of 10 days. Now, if there's an, uh, a ground condition in section B that's a lot better than what we thought, uh, they, they can, in theory, say, instead of whatever, I'm now minus a few days from section B. But what Philip 1 and 2 says is that A plus B can never be earlier than the original completion date. So, so they, can, they can set off EOTs, but they can never get you an earlier completion date than the one that is fixed in the time of tender. Mm. The, there's no such qualification I see in the ML book. Someone either deleted it or something. I'll, I'll tell Zoltan. He drafted it. He must have forgotten it. So, so, so what we have is that you potentially, for the first time, you could have an earlier completion date than even the one set out in the tender, the original completion date. And I think that's a bit wrong. I mean, that pe people have to plan. People can't suddenly say, oh, I'll accelerate six months because you, you, you have less quantities here, because that's not the way it works. Yeah, but, but there exactly. you go, it, 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 it's, it's, it's unfortunate, I think, but there you go. Yes, yeah, okay, that's very good. Um, let's have a look. Ah, yes, um, do you know if any of the contracts have been used yet? Uh, uh, sorry, has the Emerald book been used for any contracts? Um, anecdotally, I know it's been used for mining and 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 uh, uh, possibly. Okay. Uh, I, I think I, I think in, in 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 Europe, but not not to my knowledge in Asia. Um, Understand? Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I spoke to people, and and I think a lot of employers are very interested in it. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> they, they like to speak about it, but when it comes to come to contract, they somehow go back to the yellow book or something. I don't know why. It, it's it's maybe the, the lack of. Like I said, the lack of entitlement, the enlightenment, or the lack of uh, guts, or or it is not definitely being used on any project finance projects. Really, I think that's the biggest uh, issue for for the Emerald Book, um, for the typical yeah. ones where there's where there's project finance, or for government jobs. I mean, government jobs are quite difficult as well because there's a budgetary requirement that they report to the leg legislative committee and all that. And how about telling the the legislative committee? Um, it's five million, but it could be six million or seven million. They can't do that, and, and that's yep. why I think I think that's why it's difficulty. Unless we have a mini GBR or a mini whatever, and there's a cap on it, and maybe that would be acceptable because the the, the the developers can say, look, I think for this excavation is you know just this part of the dam project for this these two tunnels is particularly unknown what we're going to see and no one knows how many rocks or boulders or water we're going to encounter and we, we we set a gbr but we set a limit to it to say look it's only for this section um, any engineer can tell us that the max you're going to be out is another 50 million so they have some confidence that it's 5 million plus another 50,000 for that section maybe i mm -hmm. mean that's how they will do it otherwise they will never agree to it and that's the difficulty about it great okay thanks thanks for that Okay, I think I think we'll just have one final question. Um, Seven o three, GBR plays a very crucial role. Does FIDIC provide a guide on how the GBR should be written to avoid ambiguity? Um, can I not be quoted by FIDIC? Because I, I I know that, you know I, I tend to go to FIDIC talk yeah. and I I'm very critical and I, I get scolded by FIDIC and not not invited back. So especially Zoltan <laughs> after this is my friend as well. Um, I, I think the guidance is very good. It, it's very technical, mm -hmm. though. It doesn't deal with the legal issues that I just mentioned. And I think, you know, everybody, if you go to the website and Google, everyone says what a wonderful ammo book and all that. But I think what, what they don't see is that the, the guidance on, 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 on the GBR is not very legal. I mean, for example, they, they have a whole section A that I don't like at all, really. I don't like it because it allows employers to put in too much data in the section A and therefore claim that it's foreseeable. You know, foreseeability mm -hmm. is a wrong yeah. test. You know, I never like foreseeable because look, if you look at NEC, NEC is actually not about foreseeability. NEC is about how much can the contractor uh, expect to do because many things are foreseeable, right? But doesn't mean that I will then uh, prevent it. So a, a project next to the sea, I can foresee that the tsunami, but do I then, because I'm foreseeable, price for it? It's a bit wrong. Uh, it, it's such a low probability of occurring that even though I can foresee that it might happen, um, why yeah. why should I price for it? And that's where I think Felix starts with the wrong sort of possibility. That on top of that, they use part A to have a very generic where I think rightly or wrongly, the employers are throwing lots of data and then it makes the contractor's uh, liability increase 
dramatically just because you can foresee it. So, so, so telling me that you can foresee a uh, 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 seepage in section one of 50 cm per hour to 100 cm, I don't care because you said 75. So even though you can foresee 100, so what? We, we agree, I should price at 75 and beyond 75, you should just pay. You shouldn't, you shouldn't not pay. You shouldn't then ask me, but was that foreseen by you? I think that's wrong. But then mm -hmm. CPL is meant to be very clear. It's meant to be very simple. Up to 75, employer will, will, will expect you, the contractors, to, to price that into your tender. Anything above that, we just go on a basic, every unit that goes over 75, I will pay you on the BQ rate. That's it. It has to be that way. Yeah. But, but it's a good right. thing. Hey, thank I, you. Wish they were, I wish they would draft a proper GBR that we can all use. I mean, it, we have lots of GBRs, but you know, mm. it's, it's something that they should. Maybe need a study to draft one. <laughs> I, I honestly believe, believe there should be um, because different employers uh, require different requirements in the GBR. Yeah, it's very difficult to get like one standard GBR. And, and I think, I think yeah, a lot yes. of employers get so, nervous. If you have a template GBR, it actually helps them to visualize what they're paying for because that's the thing. They must yes. understand what they're paying for and then they will adopt the annual book. That's my firm belief. You know, and once employers actually understand the way that you have understood it today, I hope. Uh, it is not paying more. It is not a blank check. It is not giving more claims to the contractors. That's what they are at the back of the mind. They are worried about. I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Understand. Right. Yeah. So Bernard. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So Bernard Zeta. Uh, many thanks for um, speaking to us today on our first uh, live webinar. Um, I was a bit worried because we, myself and Abby, got cut out at one stage, but we managed to reconnect to you. Um, so yes. thank you, thank you very much um, for the for the talk. And then hopefully uh, next time when we can have a, a live event, then you might find yourselves in uh, Manila and you can uh, come and meet us um, at the Elks Club. So yes, once again, thank you very much. Not a virtual deal. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much for inviting us. All the best and uh, stay safe. Yeah. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a great weekend. Um, all the best and look forward to um, uh, look at the website because we'll be uploading the uh, PowerPoint for you to uh, take a further look, look at it. So that's the end of the event tonight. So hope everybody has a good weekend and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks very much.